the search for wreckage that could reveal why the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up. Hello again. The American space fleet has been told it won't be allowed to fly until scientists have discovered what caused yesterday's disaster when the shuttle Challenger blew up just 72 seconds after takeoff. The three remaining shuttles, Columbia, Discovery and Atlantis, will stay on the ground until experts say that all is safe. Challenger had taken off from Cape Canaveral in Florida and its wreckage fell into the Atlantic Ocean. Now ships and planes are searching a vast area of the sea for that important wreckage which could give them clues to what the cause of the disaster was. Newsround space editor Reg Turnell has reported every mission since Americans first went into space 25 years ago. Now, for the first time, he looks at why one mission flew into tragedy. The search for wreckage is vital. They told me at Cape Canaveral just now that already hundreds of small pieces of debris have been recovered. For once, the computer data doesn't tell what went wrong, so it's hoped that, as in an aircraft crash, the wreckage may tell the story. The mystery is all the more difficult to solve because NASA has had a perfect safety record in space for 25 years. There are two main theories. First, bad weather may have played a part. It kept Challenger hanging about on the launch pad for many days, and it was very frosty the night before launch. Secondly, inside the payload bay was probably the heaviest satellite the shuttle had ever carried, weighing 18 tons. But at first, everything looked perfect. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. We know the external tank was carrying half a million gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Maybe the fuel lines between the tank and Challenger broke, perhaps damaged by the weather. It's more likely one of Challenger's three main engines blew up. The other possibility is that when Challenger went to full throttle, that 18-ton satellite broke loose and crashed through into the tail. If that was the cause, some of the debris which rained down for nearly two hours may provide the evidence the scientists are seeking. Today, flags have been flying at half-mast throughout America in honour of Challenger's crew. Almost certainly, they died instantly. Many of their families were watching the takeoff at Cape Canaveral. Among the messages of sympathy today, one from the Queen. She said the shuttle's many successes had taken their price in brave young lives. The Russian leader, Mr Gorbachev, said the Russian people share America's grief. And the Pope, too, sent a message of sympathy. The flight commander was Francis Scobie, a veteran Air Force pilot. His co-pilot was Michael Smith. This was his first flight on the shuttle. Ellison Onizuka's job was to launch the satellite's Challenger, that, uh, to launch the satellite's challenger was carrying. Ronald McCare was one of the three scientists on board. Judith Resnick, the second American woman in space, had operated the shuttle's robot arm on a previous mission. Gregory Jarvis was on board to do experiments on weightlessness. And finally, there was teacher Krista McAuliffe. She was the first ordinary person in space. This report from Roger Finn. Krista McAuliffe was selected by NASA from the 11,000 people who entered a competition to fly on the shuttle. She said she wanted to use the flight to show children what it was like to live in space. NASA gave her some of the basic training the astronauts have to go through, including experiences of weightlessness. She said she loved the feeling and that it was like being Peter Pan. She was going to give two lessons from space, beamed by television to classrooms all over America. Yesterday at Krista's school, as at many schools across the country, pupils had gathered to watch the launch on television. They were left shocked and stunned by the tragedy. Last night, President Reagan tried to comfort them and others who were deeply upset. And I want to say something to the school children of America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew is pulling us into the future, and we'll continue 
to follow them. Considering the great risks involved, the conquest of space has had very few big accidents. Nearly 20 years ago, three American astronauts died when their spacecraft caught fire before takeoff. Four Russians were killed on two separate Soviet space missions. Yesterday, the total death figure suddenly doubled. Challenger's disaster was the first during a manned American space flight, and there have been 56 of them. But many experts have predicted that something like this was bound to happen sometime. 13 more shuttle flights have been planned for this year, but now everything's halted while the investigation goes on. So, what's the future for the space shuttle? Here again is Reg Turner. None of the NASA chiefs I've been talking to today has any doubts. The shuttle will soon be flying again. They hope within six months. And Challenger, which was making its tenth flight, will be replaced. Half the parts for a replacement have been made already. It'll take just over a year and two billion dollars to build a new one. Meanwhile, they'll have to go back to test flights with the present shuttles, probably with only two astronauts aboard. That means all the new science missions to follow up Voyager's exploration of the planets will be postponed for at least a year. The space telescope, intended to look right back to the beginning of the universe, won't get launched till next year. And America certainly won't be able to watch the Halley's Comet fly by in March. NASA's top priority will be resuming work with Space Lab, for the Russians are already far ahead with making medicines and metals in space. And of course, they don't want Ariane, Europe's launcher, to take all the orders for launching TV and communications sa satellites. That's what really makes spaceflight pay. The 16th Ariane launch is due next month, but last time, that too blew up. Well, one of the missions certain to be delayed by yesterday's tragedy is the Columbia flight, which was to have carried the first British astronaut, squadron leader Nigel Wood. He was due to take off on June the 24th. Squadron leader Wood is a jet pilot, but his job on the mission was to carry out spe uh, six special experiments. He'll be studying weightlessness and the effects of radiation in space. He'll also oversee the launch of Skynet 4, a new military communications satellite. In spite of the Challenger's disaster, he still intends to travel to NASA headquarters in Texas on Saturday to continue his intensive training. His wife and two daughters hope to travel to the United States to see him take off. The whole family say they're still looking forward to Squadron Leader Wood's trip into space. So, just one story on Newsround tonight, and Britain's Nigel Woods is hoping, like the rest of the space team, that the shuttle will fly again safely and soon. But let's end tonight with the words of President Reagan as he paid this tribute to those who died. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God.